you. On my way here, I took the train. Yes, I'm from Chicago. Yes, I take the train quite a bit. That one was running a little bit late, but it's all right. So I got here. Uh, the reason I took the train is just it's annoying to park my car and, and all that. So I just figured deal with the commute uh, via mass transit. Well, I'm on the train and um, I look across the, the car and I see this beautiful girl. And I'm like, you know what? You don't just walk up to some girl on a train. It's kind of weird. I did it anyway. So I walk to the back of the train car and I just start chatting her up. And oh, I noticed you're wearing a pair of Converse. I also wear Converse. And uh, we start talking a little bit. It turns out she was a statistician. So she plays with statistical modeling stuff for one of the financial firms here in Chicago. And so we're talking for about five minutes and I'm like, well, my train stop's about to come, but can I get your number? And she's like, yeah, sure. And so she wrote something down and she handed it to me. And right as I got off the train, I looked down and I realized she only gave me an estimate. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about financing agile delivery with forecasts. And we're going to talk about numbers and statistics and averages and all those kinds of fun things. So I already had a wonderful uh, introduction. Don't need to cover this. Um, I'm into numbers. I went to school for electrical engineering and I did an MBA. So got real into the data, uh, which made the marketing classes extra hard because marketing is such a weird science. Um, anyway, I like solving biz big problems in business and I see this financing problem as being one of those big, big problems. Uh, a little bit about my company, we do these agile transformation things around the world. Actually, technically, we are global. Last year, 20% of our revenue came from foreign countries. So that was uh, a lot of plane rides. Um, but anyway, we're in Chicago, New York, Seattle, and Los Angeles doing public scrum courses. So if you need any help, let me know. Most software projects start the same. And what I mean by that is you assemble a bunch of people. We find a few different people from different areas, maybe QA, design, engineering. Does this start, sound familiar to a lot of you? And you, how many of you are project managers full-time? Ooh, this is only my second PMI event, so this is just a very different group of people. Um, and so you guys get involved and you have to coordinate all of these activities and start creating risk mitigation plans. And all right, I think I'm on the right track here. So this is what happens when you get that email. There's fixed scope, fixed date, fixed budget, and you know this is going to hurt. Anybody run into this situation? Never. Unrealistic dates. You don't know how they came up with these numbers, and yet you're the one that has to make this work. All right, this is a tough job. Um, so a year later, we see this. <laughs> yeah, we tried to rewrite the entire application in one year, and it was a disaster. Um, these things happen for a lot of reasons. Unrealistic expectations, again, uh, could happen because the customer changed their mind halfway in the middle of the project and realized all those requirements that had been gathered were wrong, or at least not right enough. Anyone felt that pain? Just a few of you? Okay. Not enough people, so they assigned 50 people to the project, but you only got 41 of them. Is that ever a problem you had? Yeah. Yeah, everything would have been fine had we had those nine others. So it's a common situation going on over and over and over again, which leads us to this. How many of you are going through some form of an agile adoption, transformation, la la la? Whoa, a lot of you. Yeah, and those oftentimes start the same. They start with some sort of a failing project. They start with some sort of mis-expectations or even more fun when there's a complete change in the C-suite and some new people come in and we did agile at my last company and we're gonna do it here. So we start learning some things. We start adopting some new practices. I'm sure some of you have seen at least one or two of these. Nexus, any Nexus fans? Have you even heard of it? Just one of you? Uh, how about Scrum, at least Scrum? It's the most popular one, okay. Uh, how about DAD, do I have that one up there? Yeah, Disciplined Agile Delivery. Didn't the PMI group just buy them? Or something like that, merger? Yeah, okay. So yeah, close to your heart. Uh, how about Scrum at Scale? They're, they're scrappy and they're making a lot of waves. So lots of, lots of these techniques are getting applied um, and companies are trying to get better. So we practice these things over and over and over. We learn, we try some more things, things blow up, we try again, we keep trying and trying and trying. Has anyone ever stopped their agile transformation and gone back to waterfall? Only one of you, two of you? Yeah, it happens. I call it like a, a snapback where you know, the rubber band stretches too far and then just snaps back. But most companies plow through this. They eventually get to a point where they're starting to get a little bit more nimble, and we start seeing results like that. How many of you have made happier customers as a result of your Agile transformations? Good. Not as many as I was hoping to see, but still non-zero. Um, so let's look to October when uh, we have budget planning. 
Now, this is a kind of a weird meeting because we got to sit down and talk about all the things we're going to do next year, get the budget locked down just right, figure out what all those projects are going to be and when their due dates are so we can figure out how to financially plan for it. Who's been through this process? A lot of you. Okay. Might be why we're here today. So yeah, this doesn't work. This only works if you can accurately predict the future, um, at least when it comes to complex projects. So all right, let's take just one minute. Talk to your neighbor. In 60 seconds, what happened here? I thought we had transformed everything. Why do we have this October budget problem? 60 seconds, go. All right, so what happened here? We transformed. Why do we still have a budget problem? So what I, just to repeat for everyone else, I think everyone heard that. If you don't Agile transform everything, we have these problems. So if it's just in the delivery areas and we don't hit finance, HR, those kinds of groups, we have these issues. I agree. I agree. It's a common problem. Um, that creates some friction, though, doesn't it? When we've transformed and the finance people are saying, that, that's wonderful, Scrum, Scrum Masters, can you just give me a date and budget? <laughs> um, I don't blame them. But uh, here's, here's what I'm seeing happen over and over again. You've got these technology groups that do this transformation thing or adoption, depending on their level of sophistication. But that's only this nougaty little core, the little center of your organization. Uh, they build this stuff, and then the operations and finance team are on the outsides of that, business and strategy, and even on the outsides of that. And not all of us are uh, singing the same tune. So that can happen for a lot of reasons. I mean, one reason is a lot of people don't know what the word agile means in the first place. Some people think it, it's a mindset. Some think it's a methodology. Some think it's a way to make software. But if you think about that as a business strategy, like we want to be a nimble organization, wouldn't you look at the whole picture and try to make everything nimble? That's what we've been doing from the inside with tech. So there's a lot of pieces to a proper transformation. We've got to address weird HR practices that focus on individual behavior, individual bonuses tied to strange metrics that are easy to game, uh, and move more towards team accountability. And that's, that's sort of a, an emerging field in the Agile space. Same with uh, finance, same with, what else we got? Org structures. I find there's this interesting relationship between waterfall and the org structure. It's like chicken and egg, which came first? Did you first silo and then realize waterfall might work better? Or did you work in waterfall and then realize, why don't we just silo? We work that way anyway. Um, there's a, I forget the name of the pr uh, principle, but in software architecture, uh, teams tend to architect the software that mimics their org structure. Because when you realize it's just too hard to work with that group, you silo yourself in the software to isolate your problems from their problems. Pretty crazy stuff. Uh, DevOps, irony there is DevOps was never intended to be a separate group. Uh, it was intended to eliminate the barrier between development and operations, but that's a whole other talk. Uh, contracts, so how you set up contracts with vendors can impact agility. If you set a fixed scope, fixed date, fixed all that stuff budget uh, project with your vendors and there's something wrong on their end, you're likely to have your sad face uh, emerge. All right, these are some of the bigger problems I'm seeing in the Agile world. So just look at these top five. We can't cover all of them. We're just going to cover the numbers side. but. Number one, ability to change organizational culture. Uh, number two, general resistance to change. Or three, a, a pre-existing rigid waterfall. Um, so there's a lot of these problems we're seeing outside of delivery, outside of IT, that are causing the problems we're seeing inside of IT. And so I'm out there solving these big problems. All right, here's a good one for you. Two minutes or one minute, talk with your groups, with your, your, your friend that you just made. So we're agile now. Should we still have to do estimates or commit to dates? I thought in Agile there are no dates. Go, 60 seconds. All right, what do we come up with? Should we still have to do dates? Yes. yes. Uh, well, that was easy. Uh, wh what was the discussion about? Regulatory. Regulatory stuff, OK. Expectations. What's that? Expectations. Expectations for dates? Contracts. Contracts? The role of the uh, roadmaps. Roadmap. Roadmaps, what was that? The role of the product owner? Yeah, because that's what's missing from here is the scope of what we're doing in those days. Yep. Yep. So it sounds like we can still do dates, but there's still somewhere we have to be flexible. Government projects. Government projects? 
Now, one of my clients is a defense contractor. They build uh, propulsion systems for the Navy, and the government very much likes waterfall. <laughs> Tell me what you're going to have in five years, precisely. Um, yeah, not always doable, but that's what they keep asking for. So yeah, we're, we're probably still going to have to keep doing dates. We're just going to have to find a better way to manage to them. Um, traditional methods of trying to predict all of the steps and all of the hours necessary to get up to a certain date, it's hard. It's really hard. I don't know anybody who's been able to pull it off accurately, but maybe I'm wrong. A lot of project managers in here, who is so good with Gantt charts that they can predict a two-year project down to the letter? <laughs> Got one. <laughs> Let's talk after class. <laughs> All right, so here's, here's a big problem. When we're uncomfortable with dates, we tend to pad our estimates. We had a little bit of a buffer, you know, just a couple hours, maybe 10%. Well, your team adds a buffer, and then maybe you add a buffer, and then your boss realizes usually when you say the project takes one month, it takes 1.5 months, so then they come up with a say-do ratio for you. And so every time you come up to them with an estimate for a project, they multiply it by your say-do ratio to come up with an actual value. <laughs> And then with all of these padded estimates and lack of transparency, we're still late. I don't understand it. So why do we estimate in the first place? Um, any thoughts? Why, why estimate? Goal setting. Goal setting. OK. Why else? Budget. Budget. And what? Funding. Funding. Yeah, nobody's just going to give us money if we say, well, just give us infinity money and we'll eventually solve the problem. That's not going to work. Any other reasons we estimate? Clarity. NPV. NPV? ROI. ROI. To buy in? Huh? To, buy in? Like, to get buy-in? Some accountability. Accountability? Ownership? Planning. Resource planning? Prioritization. Wow, you guys got a lot of them. Prioritization, <laughs> sure. All right, let's stop there. <laughs> uh, I think we hit a few of these, right? Is this project worth it? I need to know what that I is so that I can figure out ROI. Um, infinity at the end probably means I'm not going to get what I want for a return. Um, is the utility more than the cost? That's, that's another way of uh, looking at it. So when I was in college, one of my operations management professors put up this equation on the board that basically says value equals utility minus cost, all in units of dollars. We know what the utility is, but what is the cost? We have to understand what it's going to take to build something to understand if there really is value there. So here's, here's the best part. A lot of groups I've worked with, at the, at even the PMO level or steering committee level, they use ROI and they use all these wonderful um, three-letter financial uh, measurements, and then they don't reevaluate them later. Do we really get 1.5 ROI on that project that took us two years? Eh, why bother looking at it? It's already done. Um, total cost of ownership. How many of you actually factor that in to prioritization? Two of you out of, oh, there's like 100 of you in this room. All right, so that's 2% of you. Total cost of ownership. If you're, if you're pressing code down the pipe too fast, you can create technical debt. Technical debt is basically like financial charge card debt. You've got to pay that off eventually, else go bankrupt. But it slows down future development. So that pressure can create more expensive maintenance and development costs in the future, raising total cost of ownership. Nobody's thinking about that in the beginning. They're just thinking about what does it take to get this thing done. All right, let's look at some examples of where we might care about estimates. Anyone ever build a home? Okay. I know somebody, a couple people who have. It sounds like a horrible, painful process. My most recent friend building a home thought it was going to be done in April, and he put in some fancy camera system, you know, one of these, like, I don't know, it can tell who's at the door and maybe send you an email or, I don't know, show you when you're getting robbed. That's exactly what I want to see. And so there's all these fancy wires that go through the walls and everything, and they had the cameras all installed, and then the contractor came in and blew in this special insulation that gets really, really hot, and it chemically melted the wires that were this camera system. And he didn't know about it until he basically was taking delivery of the home. Takes delivery, checks out the cameras, they're not working. They dig, they dig, they dig, and then they find out they have to dig up all the walls. So it's like a four month delay. Um, anyway, things happen even when building homes. And we've been building homes for, I don't know, 10,000 years, something like that. Um, yeah, so we want an estimate on a home to understand, is this worth it? How long am I going to have to pay rent somewhere else or keep my existing home before I can finally move in? Because the bank doesn't let you start payments when it's done. You're making payments while they're building it. Uh, what about moving? How long is it going to take for me to move from, where am I, Philadelphia? From here to Chicago. 
if I'm going to move from here to Chicago, how long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? Do I hire movers or do I do it myself? I'm trying to figure out that return on investment. I have a friend actually moving from Wisconsin to Portland. And I think he decided to go the U-Haul route. He's going to do it himself. I'm like, knock yourself out. <laughs> moving is a pain. I try to do it as infrequently as I can. But anyway, we want to know some things about timelines. We want to know some things about budgets so we can figure out what the most cost-effective way is to move or the least painful if money is not as much of a problem. Uh, what about getting your car fixed? Has anyone ever gone to the mechanic to get tires changed and they go, oh, we're, we're agile, so we don't do dates. We'll call you when we're done. <laughs> I take it that's a no one. No one's had that happen, exactly. But there's a reason for it. If you think about tire changing and a lot of automotive repair work, it's a repeatable thing. These mechanics change tires every day. They change oil every day. Now, has anyone ever had a weird electrical gremlin in their car where on St. Patrick's Day every leap year, but only if it falls on a Tuesday, the car won't start? And then you bring it in and they're looking at you kind of crazy and they're like, um, I don't know where to start with this. It seems to be fine. And then you take it home and it repeats it and then you come back and then they're like, well, can you just leave it with us for a week? Anyone run into a situation like that? A couple of you? Yeah, it depends how long you keep your cars. <laughs> um, I have a really old car, so luckily I haven't had any crazy gremlins like that. But if you keep a car long enough, they start creating some interesting intermittent problems that are very difficult to trace. And uh, they're not going to give you a hard date. They don't know how much this is going to cost. And we're comfortable with that. We're, that's normal when you go to the mechanic. All right, here's one. Will a Gantt chart work for building a house, moving, or car repair? Why or why not? One minute with your team. All right, can we use a Gantt chart for these activities pretty easily? Yeah? Why? They're what? They're predictable. And what? Predictable. They're predictable. Familiar. Familiar. We have a general idea of what it takes to build a house, you know, minus these wiring problems with camera systems. Um, but aside from that new variable, it was just like building any other house. Standard stuff. Um, car repair. Aside from electrical gremlins, it's pretty repeatable stuff. Yeah. Right? Uh, who uses Gantt charts for software development projects? Do you find software development projects to be predictable? Okay, so there are some ways we can make it work. All right, let's talk about different types of estimates and how they feed into how we were going to forecast or predict outcomes. So deterministic, there is an answer. There is some sort of a number at the end that can be determined to figure out how long something will take, um, how much something will cost. Basically, the total cost is then the sum of all of these, all of these activity costs. And risks are generally static risks. They're not dynamic or changing or unpredictable risks. So if you are working in an environment, like say changing tires, it's easy to give a deterministic estimate because we have all the information necessary to produce that, that result. Costs are easy to figure out. Profits are easy to figure out. Uh, mass producing things like the Ford Mustang. You get, anyone ever watch that movie, uh, To Build a Faster Horse? It's fascinating. It takes five years to develop a new car. And then once they have the new car, then they just mass produce it over and over until you have like 100,000 units, units a year. But once they've developed it the first time, they generally know how long it takes to mass produce several others. Uh, probabilistic estimates. This is when things are unpredictable, when it might as well be a random variable for how long something is going to take. It might as well be a random variable for cost, and therefore it's very difficult to figure out the sum of all of these costs or the sum of all these tasks and how long they will take. So what can change when doing a large project? Let's just talk about this as a group. Everything, more specific? Resources. Scope, resources. Regulatory. Regulatory stuff, yeah. Technology. Technology, that's an annoying one. Fluctuation. Hmm? Seasonal fluctuations. Seasonal fluctuations. Resource turnover. Resource turnover. Expectations. Expectations. Okay. Timelines. Timelines. Yep, stakeholder management. Funding. Pro the, the project managers themselves can change out. Motivation can change. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've been collecting a list and it's growing. These are all of the things I've so far discovered change a lot. Uh, most recently added jury duty. 
So I, I came to train a class in California, get there, and I'm like, there's 21 of you, I was expecting 22, who's missing? Oh, you know, Ralph was in, in jury duty. Just found out yesterday, okay, jury duty. How about paternity leave? Uh, not maternity leave, you see that one coming, paternity leave. I had a friend, he took six months off. Uh, he works for a school system in Wisconsin and they get very generous paternity leave, but uh, the way he did it was like he tied three months at the end of one year, three months at the beginning of the second, and he was off for six months. That would affect any project he was on. Um, yeah, lots and lots and lots of things change. The way people make stuff changes. Anybody here a former pro uh, programmer? A couple of you? When you write code, do you always write it the exact same way every time? Like if I had you write an algorithm to sort, I don't know, a bunch of first names and last names, and would you write it the same way the second time as you did say six months ago, in the same language? Why not? Sure, do as much as I can. Why are you the wheel? Try to as much as you can, but would you try a new technique? Maybe something a little bit more elegant, a little faster? That adds complexity, that's a variable. So there's a lot of things that change, even at the micro level, even when you have the same people writing the same code in the same language, there will be variation. So it is a complex activity, meaning there are more unknowns than knowns when writing software. Um, let's look at the definition of forecast. Copy this out of uh, Merriam-Webster. So to calculate or predict some future event, use the result of study and analysis of available and pertinent data. Um, so we're gonna look at techniques to forecast development, even though it's a highly unpredictable activity. So let's look at some financial or some uh, numerical techniques we might employ. The average, we all know this one. You need at least, what, two, three data points? Take those numbers, divide them by the total number of data points, and you get the average. So the predictions of all future values are equal to the mean of the past data, but you have to have some data. If you're assembling a new project with all new people, how do you come up with the estimates of when you're gonna be done? Anyone? We don't know? A swag? What does swag stand for? That's a guess. What, uh, what else do we do? You can estimate, but then take into consideration their new, so you have a plus minus. Estimate with a plus minus, factoring in some newness. How far is that plus or minus range? It's pretty close. It's not extravagant, but... Not extravagant? Okay. Depends. Any other techniques that we estimate, typically? So you are looking at some past data, try to find a similar project. Okay. Work breakdown and then look at various <coughs> items in the work breakdown structure. Look at items in the work breakdown structure that are similar. Who here is working with scrum teams that use something called story points? All of you, well, a lot of you, majority. Um, how many of you use that information, average things out and look into the future to see how far they can get with certain things? A percentage of you that raised your hands. Okay, so opportunity for improvement there. Um, here's another approach. If you don't have a lot of data, but you have one data point, you can apply what's called a naive forecast, a naive approach. Does anybody recognize that guy? Idiocracy? Oh, man. I reference movies way too much, and very few people get this reference. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> He's, I think, the smartest person in the world. No, no, no. He was, well, never mind. I'll tell you later. So you can forecast the future by looking at just one data point, if that's all you have. It is a naive forecast, but it can be a forecast nonetheless. Um, the drift method, if you know anything about cars, that car's drifting, it, regardless. So if you draw a line between the first data point and the last data point, ignoring all variation, you get what's called the drift method. So we just kind of draw a line right through it and say, well, what happens if that goes into the future? That's a technique if you have data to play with, a lot of it. Uh, let's look at this one, the seasonal naive approach. Basically, it accounts for some seasonality, even though you're only getting like one data point per season. But you might find in certain industries, there's a lot of variation in, uh, or a lot of seasonal variation. Is there seasonal variation in software development? I kind of feel like when you get closer to the fiscal year, especially on like government projects. If you're closer to the fiscal year, what happens? Uh, things go a lot crazier. Things get crazier? Does that mean you go faster or slower? Uh, it feels like you're going faster, but you're actually going slower. Okay, could feel like you're going faster, but actually going slower. Okay, some vendors cut you off two, uh, two months a year. 
Okay, that'll make your output go down. What about internal projects? Is there any change in productivity seasonally? You ever notice around Christmas? Maybe it gets holiday brain or like around summer when that's about to kick in. Everybody just looks out the window all day and they're not really getting as much done. So there might be seasonal variation in uh, per, uh, productivity from development teams, from any office workers really. Something to look into. Uh, time series. So you can get really crazy with this stuff. I, when I was in school, I took a bunch of classes in digital signal processing. So I played with all kinds of zeros and ones and did things like I made Photoshop. I wrote it in Visual Basic so I could manipulate photos using a bunch of math techniques and smoothing and blah, blah, blah. But you can apply this to the data that you're collecting on Agile Teams to forecast. Anyone doing that? Got one, two, three. Yeah, there's some interesting things you can do with data if you're looking for it and you're collecting it and it's being produced transparently from your, your development teams and they understand the value of it. One hard part uh, I, I often find is that we can't get the data because we have development teams who think, I'm not tracking all of my time just so you can produce a pretty graph. They don't realize the value in it and if they don't realize it, maybe sell it. Sell them that value. Uh, here's an ensemble forecast. So the long and short of this is it's a type of Monte Carlo analysis where we're gonna run a simulation many, many, many times and see what happens. In this particular ensemble forecast, you see that all of our models can each, I'm sorry, each line, each colored line is a different run of this model. Closer to the left, we see that the models converge for the most part in the first couple of days. But then you see some divergence. And then over time, they're all basically saying something completely different. But there is some range that they, they all stay within, 500 to 5,800 or 5,600. That might be useful information to you. Think about a hurricane forecast. Very similar technique. So what domains do you typically see forecast? Talk to your friend, just 60 seconds. Where do we usually hear about and see and think about forecasting? 60 seconds, go. So in what domains are we typically seeing forecasts? I'm sorry, what was that? We see them everywhere. Can we be more specific again? Hmm? Finance. Finance. Well, that's interesting. Sports. 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 Weather. Weather. Energy. Weather. Energy, utility. Energy utility. Okay. Usage. Yeah. Retirement. <laughs> GDP. Yeah, macroeconomic things are forecasted. Elections. Elections. Yeah. Finance. Huh? Finance. Yeah, we got finance. Stock market. Stock market. Yep. Outfield uh, the, uh, batters? So in sports, baseball? Hmm? Yep. Elections. Elections we got? Miles to what? Empty? <laughs> yeah, that can be a forecast. I, I drive very interesting in Chicago. Like I have a stick shift and I, I like to pump the throttle and just go as fast as I can. So my mileage calculator is totally wrong all the time. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of areas where we're forecasting. We're using information that we have. We are trying to take that information and forecast possible futures with it so we can make decisions now, knowing that a lot of that information is unpredictable. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about applications of forecasting. And I'm gonna pick on two that you guys already mentioned here. So the weather. And this is, is this like what Philadelphia is like? Chicago is super erratic. I mean, one day it's 60 degrees, the next day it's 30 and snowing, the next day it's sunny. We're just used to it. Uh, we have a joke like, well, if you don't like the weather, give it an hour. It'll change. <laughs> um, yeah, just last week I left Chicago. It was raining in the 50s. I landed in New York. It was sunny and warm. Two days later, I, the, the weather flipped. New York was getting hit with all the cold as I was leaving. I came back and it was sunny and warm in Chicago. Strange place to live. California, on the other hand, I don't know if you ever go there. Los Angeles, it's always like the same. San Diego is even worse. It's like, oh, it's 71 and perfect again. <laughs> Uh, I do love San Diego though. So anyway, we use weather forecasting and um, it's gotten better over the years, it turns out. Did some research on this. A long time ago, we were even worse in our, in our weather forecast, but they're still completely unpredictable. Um, just last week, I was monitoring flights because storms were about to hit Chicago and I was like, is my flight gonna leave? Is it not? Crossing my fingers, looks like there's a hole in the sky. I think we're gonna make it. Hour before my flight's supposed to leave, it gets canceled. Ugh. It wasn't because of when I was leaving, it was because of the planes coming in. So I can't even imagine being a traffic person, or uh, airplane traffic, whatever forecaster, what do those people do? 
It just seems like a crazy job. But they have to deal with this. Um, so variables about, uh, that influence heat and influence the weather. We've got the sun hitting the Earth's surface. Turns out that like with the glaciers we have at the poles that reflects a certain amount of energy from the sun and so the Earth doesn't absorb it. And if you are into this whole global warming concept, if that ice goes away, we absorb more heat, which actually accelerates the process of melting ice. Crazy stuff. Uh, air pressure differences, that forms wind. That changes things. That moves hot air to cold air, cold air to hot air. All of these things, right? The planet's rotation, where we, how far we are from the sun, all of these little tiny variables add up to a very, very complex system uh, to try to model. And I'm told we have like millions of sensors and data points and all kinds of stuff. We put them on commercial airlines, they're on shipping vessels, they're on satellites, they're, they're all over the place, collecting information, as much of it as possible, Supercomputers are processing this in order to create forecasts, like hurricane forecasts. You guys don't have hurricane problems here, do you? Philadelphia? Who's from Philadelphia? Go Eagles? Is that right? <laughs> um, so uh, the point I'm trying to make is it's a very complex system. We use all this information. We try to compute some sort of a sense of reality from that. Now let's look at financial forecasting. There's a couple of ways we can sort of predict where a stock is going to go. Uh, this is an example of fundamentals analysis where a, a stock trader, not a trader, but a research analyst is going to look at a company or a selection of companies in a lot of depth. They're going to look at their management team. They're going to look at their balance sheet. They're going to look at their P&L. And they're going to try to forecast for the next five years where they think that company is going in order to make a buy or sell recommendation. Anyone ever heard of this? Maybe? All right. This is a, yeah, digging into the fundamentals of a company is one way to do it. Another way people do it is through technical analysis. We don't care about the quality of the company. We just want to look at the way it's trading. And we look at the signal of buys and sells, buys and sells in stock prices. And we try to look for a trend. In this case, it looks like we have, uh, we're using that drift method forecast where you have a data point in between the top and the, um, the front and the, the end. And then we just draw a line straight through it. So it looks like this particular stock is trending up. Maybe I wait for a dip and then I buy it. And that's what a day trader does. Now, whether or not you like these techniques is you know, your opinion, but these are techniques that are being used to make some sense out of a crazy complex stock market so people can make money. This is an example of uh, a forecast using a cone of uncertainty. So uh, at the end of 2011, someone, I, what is it, the source, real tick, something, they did a, a survey of the information they had available to them, basically thought that the S&P 500 was gonna hit 1351 by the end of 2012. Now, if I were an investor who thinks, oh, that must be accurate because some smart people thunk it up, and I put all of my money in at 2012, I might be in for a rude awakening. What actually happened is it dropped, and oh, I can't see my slide notes, it was somewhere around 1240 is where it actually landed. Now, it was still within the range of uncertainty, but for the most part, most things had it going up, not going down. It actually did go down. But that's the best we could do at the end of 20, 2011. Um, here's another one. I don't know. We, technical analysis people look at this. I got a friend who's a trader for uh, commodities. He trades soybeans. Strange thing to trade. But not a lot of people trade it, so he doesn't have a lot of competition. And he's trying to automate some of it. And uh, he was showing me a graph that looked very similar to this, where he watches for these breakout points, where you'll see the soybeans going up and down in value, up and down. But if it drops below a certain amount, that's abnormal. And he'll write software to trigger a buy. So he'll buy a bunch of contracts and then watch it go up, and then by the end of the day, sell it at a profit. Now, what can we do in the real world? Anyone using Jira? Do you use this chart? Got one, who uses this chart? The version report. Only a couple of you. Oh man, I, everywhere I go, I ask people if they use Jira. Everyone raises their hand. You know this report, nope. Just dig into the reports page. This is one of the most unutilized tools in Jira. You're already paying for it. If you get a development team to give you know, good faith, honest estimates to their work and close their sprints appropriately and just use the tool like it was designed and you create a version and you have at least three sprints of history, which is an annoying quirk of Jira, it will give you a forecast of when it thinks all of that work that you've assigned to a version is gonna be done plus or minus 10%. Now, that doesn't really factor in the true instability of a team, 10% is fairly arbitrary, but that's better than nothing. And every time the estimates change, every time velocity changes, every time scope changes, this, this display updates automatically for you. 
Wonderful stuff. So if you're not using it, I recommend that as a homework assignment. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about, in a way, why we're here. So I did some experimenting and some modeling. Uh, I applied some of these modeling techniques in Excel, and anyone can do this in Excel, um, using some Monte Carlo analysis stuff. And so I took a team that had a lowest velocity of 23 story points per sprint. Their highest velocity was 40. They had 453 points of remaining work for a particular release. And I ran 1,001 runs. Why 1,001? Because I created the first one and then accidentally hit 1,000 instead of 999 for additional runs. And then I just was like, who cares? 1,001 is fine. Blended team rate. I just figured out, well, what, would what would a team cost of 32 different people across four teams? And I came up with $46,000. Now, where are these people? Who cares? $46,550 per week for this team. Um, and so I ran the model, and what I came up with was this project to finish was going to hit, at minimum, $527,000 of cost. The maximum would have been $916,000, with a mean of about $687,000. And I was thinking, well, the mean isn't very useful, because that's right at the top of the bell curve, right? What we want to know is, how bad can this get within, say, uh, what is it, 84% probability, which is one standard de of deviation beyond the mean? and then two standard deviation, 97.5, and then three standard deviation, with a 99.7% certainty this project was gonna cost over a million dollars to finish. 22.4 weeks. So with this, coupled with something like that JIRA report, um, I can forecast the team's success and update the forecast like a hurricane forecast. If at any point throughout using um, this, these tools, an executive team isn't happy with these answers, we can make a change. What kinds of changes could we typically make when a project is either gonna to be too costly, take too long, um, not gonna get the scope we want, or, or whatever? What would we do? We could reduce scope, yeah. Who uses Scrum right now? All right, so it's your product owner's job to constantly be de-scoping a project. I mean, not really de-scoping, pushing low priority things to the bottom to make sure we finish high priority things first. In waterfall projects, a lot of that scope is already in progress. It's a lot harder to de-scope a waterfall project when everything is in flight at the same time. So you could be de-scoping. Yes, that is an answer. If you want to hit that date and you're not comfortable with cost overruns, cut it off. Make sure low-value features don't go out when they shouldn't. What else can we do? Add resources. Do you mean like add more people? Yes. All right. Um, has anyone ever tried to add like 100 Accenture consultants a month before a project went live? Well, what happened? Brooks' law. And what is it, Brooks' law? It gets worse. Adding people to a late project makes it later. Yes, adding people to a late project makes it later. So that'd be a tough one. If you're going to add people, I'd add it a lot sooner. Uh, just pick on my slide here. Um, if you were back here and you didn't like that date range and you still have months to go before that thing releases, now's the time to add people. Now's the time to start seeing that effect of new people on output and on velocity. Um, all right, so we can mess with scope. Can we mess with time? Is that ever acceptable? Sometimes. Yeah, I look for those nice round dates, like, hey, we need this done by the end of Q3. That seems really arbitrary. Why Q3? But if it's like January 11th, maybe there's a reason. I'd still ask. Um, any thoughts? Using spreadsheets and Monte Carlo analysis to forecast finance. Yeah. That's true, it depends. Uh, so the question was about risk. If there's unforeseen risk still in this project, we won't see it maybe until it's late, uh, too late. It depends on the type of risk. It also depends on how those teams are working. Uh, in general, if they're ordering the backlog in such a way where some of that risk gets front loaded, if they're building releasable pieces of functionality quickly and iteratively um, in, that, in that fashion, there is less risk typically contained at the end of a project. The things at the end of the project are usually the lower value features that we just haven't really started working on yet. So how you compose the work, how you break those requirements into smaller pieces will impact how much risk you end up getting surprised with at the end. Anyway, uh, I have this spreadsheet and I have this stuff. If anybody's interested later, just, I don't know, give me your business card, I'll send you an email. So what can we do with this information? If we had the ability to financially forecast thing using a commonly available tool like Excel without any special plugins, um, what, what would we do next? C could you use this? Could you explain the language of forecasting to an executive team? Or are we still, still going to go back and go do dates again? 
hard dates, hard scope, hard costs. So the, the techniques I'm finding are the most effective when dealing with, with an executive team, especially your CFO, is keep talking about financial forecasting and how it's basically the same thing as what we're doing. Highly unpredictable, many, many, many variables. It's easier just to track the data and make sense of it rather than try to predict end dates based on assumptions. Um, this is the heart of empiricism. Create transparency and with qualified inspectors, regularly, regularly look at the data and make decisions about what next, what next to do. So I, I was looking at some financial risk mitigation techniques and how we would apply those same concepts to say portfolio management. And here's what I came up with. The asset allocation strategy where you apply, you know, say 80% of your money to equities and 20% to bonds just to uh, diversify a little bit in where you're putting your money. The equivalent might be how much money do we put into new growth, high potential projects or products versus our keep the lights on stuff. Some might be a more safe investment than the others, right? So one way to think about it in terms of mitigating financial risk, your finance people should understand these concepts. Uh, portfolio diversification. So we've got a bunch of different high risk, high reward projects. And instead of investing a bunch into any one of them, we invest a little bit into a lot of them. If you think about like venture capital firms, this is what they do. They take on like 10 projects. All of them are probably going to fail, but one of them should probably succeed. And that one's got to return like a thousand percent while the other ones all lose money. So if you look at it like that and you apply a little bit to all of these different investments and see which, which one shakes out, um, you focus, all your, focus more of your resources on that particular, that particular project or that particular product. And dollar cost averaging is kind of, maybe it's a little bit of a stretch here, but dollar cost averaging, the idea is like with your retirement plan. Every month you're putting in the same amount into your retirement fund. Some months you're buying fewer uh, assets at um, higher prices. Some months you're buying a lot more of them at lower prices, but you're, you're mitigating some of your losses by regularly investing the same amount frequently into, this, um, into your retirement fund. You can do something similar with how you invest in, in projects if you think about small batch iterative planning and funding. Rather than doing an October planning, which is almost like dumping all of your money into your 401k at one point in the year, why don't we do this monthly? Have a monthly budget, budgeting discussion, a much shorter meeting, and just look at what can be accomplished in the next 30 days and where we want to invest our money. Um, so we're not going to stop estimating. This is just the laws of project physics. Uh, we're going to always be asked what we're going to get for our money, when it's going to be done. We can come up with some better answers, though, if we use forecasting techniques and manage the complexity using just some data modeling techniques. How frequently would you update your forecasts? What seems reasonable? End of every sprint. End of every sprint. End of every sprint. That's a good idea. How long are your sprints typically? Two weeks. Okay. Does it have to be two weeks? It could be monthly and it could be weekly. It really depends on how much risk you have in your environment. If you have a risky environment, I recommend shorter sprints, at least no more than a week. But if you want to do two weeks, great. Who is currently showing financial forecasts or financial updates regularly in your two-week sprint reviews? Who has a second meeting to go talk to the executive team to share that exact same information? A couple of you. Who isn't doing it at all? A couple of you. All right, for those of you not raising your hands, I'm not sure which bucket you'd fall into, but if you have this information, it's a great place to show it in your sprint review, especially if you have stakeholders in there that should be in there, like people who've invested in what you're building. Um, so building an agile business is really a business problem. It's not so much a tech problem. And we've got to look at this as, as a big picture, because on the finance side, if we're still expecting large batch projects with fixed dates, that pressure usually falls on the development team. They build technical debt, and you end up missing expectations anyway. So I highly recommend we start shrinking the batch size for budgeting down to a, a frequency that's more or less in line with the way you're delivering. Adaptable teams require adaptable funding. That's really uh, the point here. So if you can't predict the future, forecast the future. Um, that's what I would say. And thank you. Thank you. I think we're about out of time. Thank you.